Those of us who grew up in church all know about the story of the Tower of Babel, but how well do we understand it? The actual text of the Bible doesn't say exactly what many people think it does, and even scholars are sharply divided on how to interpret it. I also want to know more about the mythology and the history surrounding the story. Did other civilizations have their own Babel story? Is there any historical evidence for a real Tower of Babel, and if so, what would it have looked like? I'll investigate all these questions and more in this video. It might surprise you to know that the phrase Tower of Babel never occurs in the Bible, and the name Babel itself is simply the Hebrew word for Babylon. It is a historical curiosity that English Bibles going all the way back to Wycliffe's Bible in the 14th century translate the Hebrew word for Babylon as Babel only in this chapter and in Genesis 10 verse 10. Everywhere else, the normal English word Babylon is used. No one knows why Wycliffe chose to make the distinction, yet our Bibles to this day continue to mimic his decision. And just in case you were wondering, no, the English word Babel is not related in any way to Babel. The founding of the great cities of Mesopotamia was a core element of ancient Sumerian and Babylonian creation myths. A Sumerian text, known as the Eridu Genesis, tells of the establishment of five great cities, Eridu, Bad Tibura, Larak, Sippar, and Shurupak, after creation but before the flood. The famous Sumerian king list provides a similar history of antediluvian cities. The epic of Atana describes the founding of Kish as the first city. In Enuma Elish, the Babylonian creation epic, Babylon is the first city following the world's creation by Marduk. According to the historian Barassus, Babylon was founded at creation and was the first city resettled after the flood. In the poem of Era, Babylon is likewise built before the flood and rebuilt again afterward. The early chapters of Genesis show a similar interest in the first cities. Genesis 4.17 describes the founding of the city of Eridu, or Irad in Hebrew, by the patriarch Enoch. Genesis 10 verses 8 to 12 describe the founding of the first great post-Diluvian cities, Babylon, Uruk, Akkad, Nineveh, Kala, and Rezin. So what does that have to do with Babel? It's important to note that the story of Babel isn't primarily about a tower, it's about a city with a tower. As many scholars have noted, the tower is only mentioned together with the city, and at the end of the story, Yahweh's punishment is directed at the city with no mention of the tower. As such, the story of Babel's, or rather Babylon's founding, is a natural fit for the Bible's primeval narrative in light of similar Near Eastern literature. However, the part of the story where the people of the world are dispersed and their languages are confused, that's unique to Genesis as far as we can tell. I'm going to be using the translation by the late Edwin M. Good in his book Genesis 1-11, Tales of the Earliest World. It preserves the mythical qualities of the original without relying on previous English translations. Who is it about? The whole earth had one language, and few words. And it happened, as they were wandering in the east, and they found a valley in the land of Shinar, and they settled there. The story starts by telling us the whole world had one language and that they were wandering in the east, or from the east, the grammar is unclear. Who are they? All the people of the world, it would seem. This is fine until we put the story in its larger context. Just prior to the Babel story is a passage known as the Table of Nations in chapter 10, which describes how the descendants of Noah branched out to become the 70 nations of the world, all with their own languages. And then chapter 11 suddenly resets everything and we're dealing with the monolingual ancestral tribe of all mankind, who settle in the land of Shinar and build the first city. These stories are not connected by narrative or by chronology, but by topic. Bible scholar Thomas L. Thompson, in his book The Mythic Past, writes, The Table of Nations of Genesis 10 and the Tower of Babel story of Genesis 11 are variant parallel stories. Conceptually independent, they cannot be read as if Genesis 11 happens after Genesis 10. They evoke the same etiological reality. Both begin in an imaginary world of human unity. Both give an account of how the Earth's many peoples developed, each with its own land and language. Who's the story not about? 
Sir not appearing in this film. Many people associate Nimrod with the Babel story. However, Nimrod, the mighty hunter who founds Babylon and other great cities of Babylonia and Assyria in Genesis 10, is not mentioned here. Later Jewish and Christian interpreters, beginning with Philo and Josephus, made Nimrod out to be the main villain of the Tower of Babel story. But that's not actually biblical. What is their plan? And they said to one another, Come on, let's make bricks and burn them hard. And they had bricks for stone, and pitch served them as mortar. And they said, Come on, let's build ourselves a city and a tower with its top in sky. And let's make a name for ourselves, lest we be scattered all over earth. First the people decide to make some bricks. Once they have the bricks, they decide to build a city and a tower. This is a rather odd order to do things in. You would expect them to plan the city first and then to make the bricks. One explanation is that this mirrors the Babylonian custom of ceremonially preparing bricks for a year before building monumental structures, which is reflected in the Enuma Elish. The people's purpose for building the city and the tower is twofold. To make a name for themselves, and to avoid being scattered. Making a name is usually interpreted as becoming famous, but it's not clear what fame would entail in a world where no one else exists. The conjunction lest is also a puzzle. How does becoming famous prevent the people from scattering? Dutch Bible scholar Ellen van Volde argues that the phrase must mean striving for unity in this context. At this point in the story, we face a more serious problem of interpretation, however. Most people, including most Bible scholars, are raised in a Christian tradition that conditions them to read the Bible story as a moral fable about sin and pride. The predisposition to read it this way is strengthened by the fact that it is preceded by three stories in which humans commit grievous sins and are punished by God as a result. Adam and Eve eating the fruit, Cain murdering Abel, and the flood. Recently, however, several scholars have made the case that Babel isn't a story about sin and punishment at all. Wanting to live together in a city is not a sin. Desiring fame or unity is not a sin. Hold on to that thought as we move on to Yahweh's response in the story. How does Yahweh react? And Yahweh came down to see the city and the tower which the humans had built. And Yahweh said, Look, it's one people, and they all have one language. And this is only the beginning of what they will do. And now nothing they intend to do will be impossible for them. As in the Eden story and the Cain and Abel story, Yahweh is depicted in somewhat primitive terms. As Philip Sherman puts it, he appears as a curious god who must be on scene if he wishes to be informed about human activities. Yahweh is upset at what he discovers. He is not upset at the city or at the tower per se. He is not upset at any sin the people have committed. He is not perturbed by their hubris. Instead, he bemoans, Look, they are one people, and they all have one language. Nothing that they intend to do now will be impossible for them. Their unity, their language, and their competence, those are what threaten Yahweh. And need we be reminded that speaking one language is exactly how Yahweh created humanity in the first place? What about the tower? The tower is described as having its top in the sky. Don't let English translations mislead you with the word heaven. Hebrew doesn't make that distinction, and sky is an appropriate translation here. Some interpreters, both ancient and modern, have suggested that the people of Babel were trying to build a tower up to the firmament to invade God's domain. However, the phrase with its top in the sky apparently just means very tall, and is used again with that meaning in Deuteronomy 128. Other interpreters think that the tower reflects the ziggurat temples that loomed over Babylon and other Mesopotamian cities, implying that it too was a temple to false gods. However, there is no hint of idolatry in the text. The word used for the tower, Migdal, describes not a temple or religious structure, but a defensive citadel or city wall fortification. Remember again that the tower is never the focus of the story, it only gets mentioned twice in the phrase a city and a tower, which Ephraim Spicer and others have said is a hendiadis, two terms combined to represent a single idea like sound and fury, or smoke and mirrors. As another scholar, Theodore Hebert, puts it, the tower is an aspect of the cityscape the narrator describes, rather than the primary object of attention. The image portrayed here is one of a defensive city with high fortifications. Furthermore, as Van Valde notes, neither the narrator in his narrative, nor the humans in their discourses, nor Yahweh in his discourse, speak of a human ambition that is directed against God. 
there is simply nothing of the kind in the text. You're free, of course, to interpret the Babel story as a tale about pride or sin or idolatry, and you'd be in good company. This is just the interpretation I find convincing. Confusion and Dispersal Come on, let's go down and confuse their language there, so that no one will be able to understand what another says. And Yahweh scattered them from there all across earth, and they stopped building the city. Therefore, its name is called Babel, because there Yahweh confused the language of the whole earth, and Yahweh scattered them from there all across earth. Yahweh tells his divine companions that the solution is to go back down to the city and confuse the people's language. This has the desired result of dispersing the people all across earth, though how exactly linguistic confusion would accomplish this is left to the reader's imagination. The folk etymology given for Babel is obviously not correct. The great city's name is certainly not derived from Baalau, the Hebrew word for confusion. The usual explanation is that it comes from Akkadian Babilu, meaning Gate of the God, although Assyriologists apparently now believe that this too is incorrect, and its true etymology is lost in time. However, this pun is just one example of the wordplay that is rampant throughout the brief tale. In particular, the letters Bet, Lamed, and Nun repeatedly occur together throughout, making the babel Balal association a sort of punchline for the entire passage. It should be noted that it is clearly the city to which the name Babel is given. The tower fails to receive so much as a mention upon the tale's conclusion. Etmenaki, the historical Tower of Babel Even though the Bible does not describe the Tower of Babel as a religious structure, there is no doubt that the story's wording is inspired by the monumental architecture of Babylon. Moreover, nearly all scholars think the story is inspired by a specific structure, Babylon's Great Ziggurat. People have long suspected the connection due to a passage by the Greek historian Herodotus, written around 460 BCE. In his description of Babylon's temple precinct, he mentions a great tower a furlong in breadth and width, with eight towering levels, an ascent that spirals around the outside, and a shrine at the top. His description appears to have inspired the way the Tower of Babel is typically depicted in art, as a cylindrical tower with numerous concentric stories and a ramp that winds around the outside. Modern archaeological finds have confirmed the existence of this ziggurat, which was named Etemenanki, meaning House of the Foundation of Heaven and Earth. However, Herodotus was mistaken on several details. It did not have a spiral staircase, and it had seven stages, not eight. Its base was 91 meters square, and its height was also 91 meters. It was very likely the tallest structure in ancient Mesopotamia, about equal to the Statue of Liberty with her base included. There exists a Babylonian stele from the reign of Nebuchadnezzar II, the king who finished its construction. It includes a commemorative inscription and a diagram of the ziggurat itself. The inscription says, Nebuchadnezzar, king of Babylon am I. In order to complete Etmenanki and Eorme Iminanki, I mobilized all countries everywhere. I built their structures with bitumen and baked brick throughout. I completed it, raising its top to the heaven, making it gleam bright as the sun. The language about the baked bricks and bitumen, as well as the hyperbole about its height, are strikingly similar to the text of Genesis. It seems likely that there were Jews in Babylon who knew this inscription, or one like it, and perhaps who were even among the corvée labor that built it. So does that make Etmenaki the historical Tower of Babel? Well, not really. The city and tower of the story are abandoned monuments that exist in a mythic past. Unlike the very much inhabited Babylon and its impressive ziggurat that existed around the time Genesis was written. From Babylon to Israel The way Bible scholar Ronald Handel sees it, the Israelites understood full well that Mesopotamian civilization was far older and more glorious than their own. To define their own culture as a new beginning, they had to present the origins of Mesopotamia in a way that transferred its prestige to Israel in the same way that primacy was transferred from the older son to the younger one in the biblical stories of Jacob, Joseph, and David. Thus, the various authors of Genesis used the techniques of appropriation, mimicry, and inversion to retell these Mesopotamian stories in ways that shifted the glory to Israel and its God. Traditionally, scholars have distinguished between the early chapters of Genesis, called the primeval history, and the rest of the book, which was considered historical in some sense. They have sometimes differed, however, on whether the dividing line comes before or after the Babel story. 
If we insist on dividing Genesis this way, then I think Babel has a foot in both worlds. The city founding theme fits in with the Mesopotamian creation epics, but it also sets up the history of Israel as a nation that comes out of Babylon. The story right after Babel is that of Abraham, the father of Israel, who begins his journey in the Babylonian city of Ur. Genesis calls the city Ur of the Chaldeans, an interesting anachronism, for the Chaldeans did not settle in the region until at least a thousand years after Abraham would have lived. It's not just the narrator who calls it this, but Yahweh himself when talking to Abraham in Genesis 15.7. Abraham's father is named Terah, and his brothers are Haran and Nahor. But Terah, Haran, and Nahor are also cities in and around Syria along the route Abraham took to Canaan. These are not really historical individuals at all, but a map of Israel's origins with locations personified by characters in its ancestral story. In the story of Babel and the stories of the patriarchs that follow it, the authors of Genesis combined both past and present, legend and reality, to create a story that would help their people understand their place in the world. Dutch scholar Ari van der Kooy writes, in my view, the story in Genesis 11 is not about sin and punishment. The measure taken by God is part of the destinies determined in primeval times which, in line with Mesopotamian mode of thought, are meant as explanations of the world order as it is. I would suggest that Genesis 11 1 9 may be compared to a coin having two sides resulting from a technique which is widespread in world literature, namely of setting a story in the past and yet speaking about the present. If we misuse the Bible as evidence for historical events that never occurred, or moral teachings that were never intended, then we lose sight of what the text is really about. Thanks for watching.